Angela sits at a computer and attempts to control her own financial destiny by making a trade which she thinks is fundamentally and technically sound. Now, she's tried this in the past and it hasn't panned out, but this time, it's different, she tells herself. She's using the RSI indicator, which is a popular momentum oscillator, that measures the speed and change of price movements. The RSI has just moved under 30, indicating that it's oversold and suggesting a potential reversal in the opposite direction. Now Angela has done her homework and she's paired this indicator with the Bollinger Band, which shows support and resistance. So Angela comes to the conclusion that the price seems to have deviated far from where it should be and that a surge in price is inevitable. Now she comes to this conclusion because she's using a principle called mean reversion, which predicts that a price will be pushed back towards its trend line and return closer to its mean price after a random deviation. So all signals have lined up. Everything looks perfect. This is a sure shot, Angela tells herself, and she confidently clicks the buy button. Well, it turns out it didn't work. Something unseen interfered with signals. It seems so random, Angela says to herself. It doesn't make sense. What did I miss, she wonders. Well, some of the math considerations that Angela missed are explored in detail over in our no-code trading bot development course. In that course, linked to below, Angela would have learned how to augment her trading data with non-price related data. She also would have learned how to use more sophisticated math conditions and logic before a buy or sell trade could be initiated. And lastly, she would have learned about something called the Efficient Market Hypothesis. The Efficient Market Hypothesis, or EMH, developed by economist Eugene Fama in the 60s and explored in detail in his book entitled Efficient Capital Markets, which was published in 1970, is a cornerstone theory in finance that suggests that all available information is already reflected in a current stock price. Now, the strong variation of EMH discounts technical analysis and even fundamental analysis as having any predictive power in the markets, because all information, including including public information, such as historical data, as well as private information, such as insider trading, is already factored into the current asset's price. Therefore, you could never gain a predictive edge, which would allow you to outperform the market as a whole over the long run, because prices adjust instantaneously to new information. Now, this means that attempting to beat the market consistently over the long run is futile. The market is informationally efficient, which makes it unlikely you'll be able to gain an upper hand on it. Oh, but what about incredibly smart people, you might ask yourself? Surely they must have an edge, right? Strangely, no. In fact, a study by Morningstar has shown that there tends to be an inverse relationship between the performance of active managers and the performance of the segment of the stock market they represent. Depending on which year or which study you look at, actively managed funds tend to underperform the market about 70 to 90% of the time. So what do you think? Hit that dislike button now if you think it's not possible to beat the market. But if you're feeling optimistic today, even after hearing this, and you still think that it must be possible to beat the market, then I want you to hit that like button. But up until this point, you must admit, from a data standpoint, things are looking pretty gloomy. It seems to be, as we try to get more involved in trying to control our financial destiny by managing our investments at a granular level, by frequently moving in and out of strategically timed trades, the more harm we're actually doing to ourselves. As Buffett famously once said, for investors as a whole, returns decrease as motion increases. So with the odds stacked so heavily against us, why would we even try? Why don't we just surrender and hit that dislike button now? Perhaps it's time to give up. Or is it? Around a decade before Eugene Fama was preaching to the world that it was futile to try to beat the market, a young MIT student named Jim Simons entered a local smoke-filled cafe at midnight and witnessed two MIT professors, renowned mathematicians Warren Ambrose and Isidore Singer, huddled around a table engaged in deep conversation around a mathematical problem. It was at this point that Simons came to the decision that this was precisely what he wanted. This life, this smoke-filled cafe, this coffee, this music, and this math problem. Now, Simon's years as a student and then his professional career progressed fluidly as he quested towards this math-filled life that he wanted. Not long after graduation, he did some code-breaking for the government decrypting Russian messages. Later, he joined Stony Brook University as the chair of their math department, and all was fine and well, except that he was slowly growing restless, not with math, but with academic life. So he started peeking around corners to see what else there was out there, and it was at this point when he peeked into the world of finance. Well, let's just say he caught the bug and he decided to leave the world of academia to apply his knowledge of mathematics to the financial markets. He looked at the market like he would any abstract intellectual system. 
He looked at the math rather than doing any form of fundamental analysis. He categorically segmented the market into eight different states and designed trading strategies to identify and exploit anomalies in each state. As a side note, if you know what these eight market states are, please post them in the comments below. So it was at this point when he started a hedge fund called Renaissance Technologies and under Renaissance he started a portfolio called the Medallion Fund. When he first started out he was trading commodities and using mean reversion to take advantage of price changes that move too far from the commodity's average price. The math is quite simple. Now, If you look at the price of a commodity, whether that's steel or soybeans or coffee, the commodity will have an average price. So for example, the commodity might sell for an average of $15. Some days it might sell for $16, some days it might sell for $14. But what happens if that price breaks out to 22 or drops to 10? Well, historically what happens is the price will tend to be pulled closer towards its average price. This is mean reversion. Now, in order to take advantage of a pattern like this though, you first need to be able to spot it and then classify it as non-random. In Simon's case, once he spotted a pattern, he knew he had something to work with. Now, what he was buying, he wasn't entirely sure of himself. He knew very little about the underlying business, assets or economies behind the stocks, commodities or currencies he bought and sold. He wasn't particularly interested in the deeper context behind the market patterns he studied. He was simply interested in the pattern itself. Now, Simon's once said to a colleague, I don't know why planets orbit the sun. And he went on to say, that doesn't mean that I can't predict them. However, his early predictions didn't turn out so well. During Medallion's first year, which was 1988, the fund returned 9%. Not bad, you might think, but it is when you consider that the S&P 500 was up 16%. It appeared to be yet another point for the efficient market hypothesis. Why even try? But try he did, and in Medallion's second year, well, the fund suffered a 4% loss. During this same year, the S&P 500 was up 30%. Now it's 1989 and the score stands at 0 to 2 in favor of efficient market hypothesis. If you were Jim, what would you do? Well, rather than giving up, Simons hired Elwin Berlekamp, a renowned game theorist, to redesign the hedge fund's trading strategy. And it worked. In its third year, the medallion fund turned profitable, raking in a 55% return net of fees. Now, game theory and in general, the math behind predictions is fascinating. Now, even if you don't like math or you don't think you're good at math, the math is still fascinating. Prediction plays a huge role in all of our lives each day. We use predictions and specifically something called Markov chains or Markov decision processes to come up with how good a particular action choice is and how probable it is to bring us into the future state we're trying to get to. Now, Jim Simons himself has publicly stated that his models primarily use statistics and a bit of probability theory, but he doesn't give much information. The Medallion Fund, which isn't open to the public, is a pretty secretive fund. But let's just quickly talk about probability and Markov chains. Now, in a nutshell, the model suggests that the probability of a future state is only dependent on the present state. This means that the things that we're monitoring the movements of are memoryless. Let's quickly look at a simple model with very little complexity. So here is a transition diagram. In this diagram, you'll see that we have two states. A stock can either be in an upward trending state or a downward trending state. Now let's imagine that we knew, based on the data that we've collected, that if the market was uptrending for a week, that the following week there was going to be a 75% chance of the momentum continuing. And if we were in a downtrending week, our data tells us that we have a 20% chance that the downward trend will continue into the following week. Now, of course, this is all just made up data to help make the learning easy, but let's map this out nonetheless on a transition diagram. So if we're currently in an uptrending market, the next week, this uptrending state loops back into itself. So I'll write 75 here. And then I can make a connection with the downtrending market state and I can write 25% here. So these two markets represent states and the lines between them represent the probabilities when a transition event occurs. So here we have our downtrending market state and we know that a downtrending market only has a 20% chance of continuing its downtrend into the next week based on our historical data. So I'll loop this stats probability back into itself and I'll write 20 here. And that means that we have an 80% probability that it will transition into an upward trend next week. Now, I encourage you to research Markov chains and Markov decision processes in more detail. Essentially, they are memoryless and they only consider their current state when moving towards a future state. The difference between Markov chains and Markov decision processes are that processes introduce actions which allow choice and rewards which give motivation. Think of it as sort of a mathematical framework for modeling decision making. 
Now, this has just been a simple example, but it's fascinating when you think about it. In this video, we're talking about finance, but these decision-making models have applications in so many areas of our lives. Think about your own choices and decisions right now. How well engineered are they? How aligned are your choices to a winning probability? How aware are you even of the underlying math behind your decisions? Let me know if you even think about these things in the comment section below. So this is essentially what Simons was doing when he was investing in the finance markets. He was essentially trying to predict the future state of something with an extremely complex transition diagram full of randomness and noise. So let's fast forward a bit. How did it all turn out? Did the quantitative approach work? In short, yes. Simons went on to build one of the most successful hedge funds in history. In fact, Simons himself has been called the greatest hedge fund manager of all time. Renaissance Technologies and their most famous and profitable portfolio, the Medallion Fund, are great success stories that seem to contradict the efficient market hypothesis. This quant fund earned a 66% annualized return for 39 years. This is a massive outperformance of the market. So if you clicked on that dislike button earlier, what do you think now? Would you change your vote? Simons himself has said that the EMH assumes that the price is right, but then he goes on to say that that is just not true. There are anomalies to take advantage of in the market. A great article, which I've linked to below, has this to say about the Medallion Fund's success. To put this performance into perspective, $1 invested in the Medallion Fund from 1988 to 2021 would have grown to almost $42,000 net of fees, while $1 invested in the S&P 500 would have only grown to $40 over the same time period. Even a $1 investment in Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway would have only grown to $152 during this time. Simon's wealth, according to a 2024 Forbes study, is estimated to be around $28.1 billion, making him the 49th richest person in the world. Now let's circle back to the trader from the beginning of this video. They were trying to take advantage of a similar mean reversion strategy, but why wasn't it working? Well, the truth is that strategies stop working and anomalies get washed out. It's almost as if the efficient market hypothesis moves in and closes the gap on the advantage. So as traders, it's your job to find new patterns or the re-emergence of old patterns, or it might mean looking for a barely perceptible pattern, or bringing in new data into the equation, or sometimes it's really just about knowing human behavior. Renaissance Technologies had some of their best years when the markets were in trouble and sinking. Penevik, one of Jim's researchers, once said, What you're really modeling is human behavior. Humans are most predictable in times of high stress. They act instinctively in panic. Our entire premise was that human actors will react the way that human actors did in the past, and we learned to take advantage. So what questions do you have left over about quant trading? What remains unanswered for you? Leave your ideas and questions in the comment section below, and let's discuss this more down there. And while you're down there, don't forget to like this video. It takes a lot of work to put a video like this together, and hitting that like button or commenting really helps. So what do you think? Do you have what it takes to play this game? Now, if you're interested in learning how to build quants and trading bots without having to know how to code, head over to Chaos Theory, linked to below, to learn more about our no-code trading bot course. We'll teach you the logic required, which would allow you to design a bot to make trading decisions on your behalf. We'll teach you how to fetch market data, including price and volume data. We'll also teach you how to fetch technical indicator data, such as RSI or MACD data. Then we'll teach you how to augment that data with non-price related data. So for example, we'll teach you how to use AI to fetch market sentiment data based on the most recent news articles published for a particular ticker symbol and a lot more. And this isn't only a course for those interested in equities, options, currency, or crypto trading. It's a course for people interested in data science, machine learning, AI, and automation. What you'll learn in this course can be applied to fields far outside of investing. What you'll learn in this course could be, for example, applied to fields ranging from weather analysis to sports predictions. So if you think you have what it takes, be sure to check out our course by clicking on the link in the description below.